Hello class. Welcome to this lecture on demand and supply. Uh, this is going to be one of the most important lectures of the class. They're all important, but this is probably the one that sets the stage for the entire course. So if you understand demand and supply now, it'll be very key for you to understand it later on and moving forward. Just to give you a roadmap of today's lecture, um, a lot of it's just demand and supply, but there's a lot of key terms and topics that we need to get through in this lecture. We're first gonna start with demand, then we're gonna move on and discuss what the law of demand is and variables that shift market demand. So we'll learn about the demand curve and kind of how it moves based on changes in other variables. Then we'll turn our attention to supply We'll talk about what the law of supply is and then also kind of analyze how the supply curve can move based on other variables changing. And then once we've talked about demand and supply, both in isolation and individually, we'll bring it together and we will talk about market equilibrium. Then we'll solve that same equilibrium problem that we will be building through this lecture with math. Yay. And then we will finish the lecture by talking about changes in market equilibrium and how equilibrium can change when variables such as supplier demand change uh, and shifting the curves and how that affects market price and market quantity. So I want to preface this with some pictures. Uh, this image is from the Astoria column in Astoria, Oregon. And the reason why I'm giving you a little bit of a picture show here is because of the fact that uh, I like to start with demand first instead of supply. There was an economist named Jean-Baptiste Say who said that supply creates its own demand, but if you've ever been in business before and been unsuccessful, you know that just creating inventory does not necessarily mean it's going to sell. So the reason why I bring up this image is because one, I took the photo and I think it's a pretty darn good photo. But secondly, it shows you Astoria, Oregon. And uh, basically I wanna tell you the story about John Jacob Astor. So John Jacob Astor was born in Waldorf, Germany, emigrated to the United States. Uh, basically he was an apprentice under his brother and manufactured flutes over in Europe before he came to the United States. He knew that beaver furs and sea otter furs were actually very in high demand in uh, London, in New York, in Paris, and in Canton, which is what we called China back in the day. So what he decided to do was he traded his original flutes for beaver furs and got a decent fortune. So if you've heard of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, uh, that was founded by him. It was named after his hometown and him and Astoria, Oregon in a way. Uh, and basically he decided he wanted to build an empire. He knew that China wanted furs. He knew that Europe wanted furs. He knew that the eastern portion of America wanted furs. And so he developed a massive undertaking at the time. This was a few years after Lewis and Clark had surveyed all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is the south view of from the Astoria column. It's just a wonderful place. Um, it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, this was in the summertime um, and that's just looking southward from the Astoria column. But basically what I wanted to get into is telling you about this guy and his undertaking. He basically decided that he wanted to build a beaver fur and sea otter fur trading post on the Pacific Ocean in the Columbia River. So Astoria is named after him, John Jacob Astor. And what he decided to do is he had a ship called the Tonkin go all the way around South America and up pat to Hawaii and to the Columbia River mouth in Oregon and Washington border, modern day Washington, Oregon border, 
at the same time he was having people go by land from Montreal all the way to Oregon. So that way they can converge at the same time and basically set up a trading post, trap beavers, trap sea otters, get their furs, and then build this massive empire because he could ship then he could ship the furs out to China, he could ship the furs to Europe, and he could have them sent back to the eastern portion of the United States where most of the United States population existed at the time in the early 19th century. Just to show you how massive this was, so this yellow line represents the overland Astorian's route uh, that took about two years to complete. In fact, this doesn't even show you the entire route. So St. Louis is where they left in October of 1810. But to get to that point, what they had to do is what they started in Montreal, boated through... Uh, to Mackinac Island, then boated through Lake Superior, went down to the Fox River, took the Fox River all the way to St. Louis, and then they went up the Missouri River, and they actually ended up forking through Idaho and the high desert of Oregon to get to the Columbia River instead of going through Montana like Lewis and Clark did because the Blackfeet tribe did not like Americans because, believe it or not, Mary Weller... Meriwether Lewis actually killed a guy from the Blackfeet tribe and escaped back to Missouri. So you think of Meriwether Lewis as this great surveyor. Well, he actually murdered a Native American. So uh, there's a story for you. But really what this point of this story is to just see how massive of an undertaking he was taking. And not to be outdone was the Tonkin ship. So this is a map of the Western world. I'm going to draw you the route that they took from New York over to almost Africa, down around the Falkland Islands, up to Hawaii, and then over to Oregon. All that. That was one trip. One trip on one ship with the same people all the way to Oregon. And the craziest thing about this story is that nobody died on the first 30,000 miles of this journey. But with this last image, I also took this image. This is South Jetty, known uh, as kind of the entry point of the Columbia Bar or the Columbia River. So to the right of, your, of this jetty on this image is the mouth of the Columbia River. And to the left of this jetty is the Pacific Ocean. So this is actually kind of the mouth of the Columbia River. Um, and it's a pretty remarkable place. It's at Fort Stevens State Park in Oregon, just a few miles from Astoria. And the craziest thing about this story is that nobody died going through the Falklands, going to Hawaii, going to Africa, going through all these high, crazy seas. But eight people died entering the mouth of the Columbia River. It's actually part of what's known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. And so why am I telling you this story? The reason why I'm telling you this story is because of the fact that I like to talk about demand first, then supply second. And the reason why I talk about demand first and supply second is that the reason why John Jacob Astor went under, went and took this crazy journey and undertook this massive, massive project to make a bunch of money and ended up resulting in a bunch of dead sailors in the process and is really because of the fact that he knew there was a demand for furs. There was a demand for furs and that demand and the high price that he could get for that really convinced him that he should take this massive, massive risk to find the furs, access the furs, and create the supply that fulfills the demand. So if the demand is there, the supply will follow. As a result, that's why I like to start with demand and not supply. So on your textbook, 
you might have a chapter that says supply and demand or other textbooks or you might just hear supply and demand you might walk down the street and someone says ask you about what economics is and they'll just be like supply and demand well i like to say demand and supply because demand if it's there then the supply will follow because the supplier needs to know that there's a reward for the risk that they're going to undertake so with that being said hopefully you enjoyed some of the images and let's get into the meat of the lecture or the protein of the lecture so we'll start with demand now the important thing about this is to know that demand is the willingness and ability for a consumer to pay a price for a good or service so there are two key characteristics there there's willingness and then there's ability so willingness is just I am willing to pay this certain price but you also need to be able to afford it because if you're a business owner and you do a focus group for a specific good or service and you don't actually have people there that are actually have the means to pay for that then it doesn't matter they're not truly part of the market because even if you offer the price that they say that doesn't mean that they're actually going to buy it case in point Let's say that the dream house that you've always wanted in the location that you want has been built to your exact specifications. Let's say it costs $3.5 million to make it and build it in the place you want to the exact specifications you want. If that person that built that house just sells it for say $350,000, well, look at that. That's a great deal. You've saved essentially three million dollars to get your dream home but that only matters if you can actually afford it if you can't afford it then you're still not going to be considered a consumer or a requisite demander for that good or service and you should not be considered so demand is just the willingness and ability for a consumer to pay a price for a good or service quantity demanded is a very important distinction to make it's a it's a key piece of what we're doing here but it's distinctly different from what demand is demand is just the overall kind of encompassing that at various prices i'm willing to buy various quantities and quantity demanded specifically focuses on the amount of that good or service that the consumer is willing and able to purchase at a specific price the difference will be important and it'll be easier to understand when I show you what the demand curve is. But just for kind of a simple example, demand is the willingness and ability to buy a dozen eggs. So you're making a cake and you forget eggs at the grocery store. So you have to go back to the grocery store and you walk into the grocery store and you say to the greeter, hello, greeter, I'm here to buy some eggs. That's demand. When you get to the actual dairy section, I don't know why eggs are in the dairy section, probably because there's a refrigerator there, but really dairy, chick, it's a chicken egg, it's protein, it's not dairy, it's not milk, it's not butter. They're different things, but they're still in the same section. I don't know why, because it's refrigerated. I just answered my question, but anyways, I digress. When you get to that section, quantity demanded is the fact that when you see the price that's listed for those eggs, you decide how many dozen you're going to purchase. So maybe you think, oh, I'm going to make some omelets next week, or I'm going to make some more baked goods, and I need more eggs than just the original one, and I think this is a good price. So if it's 79 cents a dozen, you decide, I'm specifically going to purchase three dozen eggs at 79 cents a dozen. Demand is just saying I was going to buy some eggs. Quantity demand kind of gets to the nitty-gritty and says, how much am I going to buy at a specific price? There are three ways in which we can analyze demand. The first way is the demand schedule, which is just going to be a table that has two columns. One column represents the prices and the other column represents the quantities demanded at those specific prices. So how many units are demanded by the entire market at a specific price for that good or service? We can take that data and plot it on a graph just like we did with the production possibilities frontier from the production schedule in the last lecture we can take those points plot them on the graph connect the dots just like you did back in elementary school and boom you've got yourself a demand curve 
and that demand curve is going to basically be where most of our analysis is going to occur. The third way in which we can analyze demand is mathematically through equations, and we will use that analysis when we talk about market equilibrium. So here's an example of a demand schedule. In the first column, we have price. So we have five different prices for televisions in this demand schedule. And the second column, we have quantity demanded. So this says how many televisions would be demanded at those corresponding prices in the first column. So if we have a market price of $1,000 for our televisions, then there will be 500,000 televisions demanded by the entire market. If we lower the price to $800, then that quantity demanded increases to 1 million, and it will keep increasing as we lower the price. So 600, we have 1.5 million, $400, we have 2 million, and $200, we have 2.5 million. If we take this information and we plot it on a graph, we're going to put price on our y-axis, our vertical axis on the graph, and we're going to put quantity on our x-axis or our horizontal axis on the graph. If we take this information, we plot it on the graph and connect a corresponding line between all the points, we have ourselves a demand curve. So here is the demand curve that was generated from the data that was on the previous slide. So at $1,000, we had 500,000 units demanded. At $800, we had 1 million units demanded. At $600, 1.5. At $400, 2 million. And at $200, 2.5 million, and a bunch of other combinations in between on this linear demand curve. So the reason why we use a demand curve is it helps us visualize the relationship between price and quantity demanded. It helps us visualize the law of demand. It helps us visualize changes in other variables that could affect demand. It helps us visualize equilibrium when we bring supply in. And it helps us visualize changes in equilibrium when variables change such as supply or demand and so really it's a good model to show and demonstrate kind of how things fluctuate and change and kind of the important relationships and concepts to understand if you're running a business or if you're an economist that's doing an analysis for a business you're not going to really use a demand or a supply curve so spoiler alert in the real world, we don't necessarily use these. These are really just models to help you understand and demonstrate the concepts. But in reality, once you understand the concepts, you can just take tables and data in Excel that you get in terms of sales and focus groups and competitor sales, etc., to kind of understand what you need to do with your pricing. You don't actually have to plot it. But for right now, it's very important that you understand this because really all of our analysis is going to be used a lot, utilizing these graphs throughout the entire course, and it's important for you to understand the relationships between them. So the question now is, why is demand downward sloping? So in the previous slide, you noticed that the curve kind of was higher towards the y-axis and zero, and then as it increased away from that y-axis and towards the x-axis and away from that zero point, it was a lower point on the graph. So that downward sloping curve relationship means we have a negative slope, and that negative slope implies a inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. So that means as price goes up, quantity demanded so a specific point quantity demanded goes down if price goes down the quantity demanded goes up and this relationship is known as the law of demand so remember in our first lecture i talked about ceteris paribus it means everything else held constant so as we're going to learn there's a bunch of reasons why demand is what it is and it's not just price so if we hold all those other variables that could affect demand constant if we look at the specific relationship between price and quantity demanded if price goes down quantity demanded goes up if price goes up quantity demand goes down and that is known as the law of demand so why do we have the law of demand why is there this inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded well there are two reasons for that 
The first main reason is known as the income effect, and the income effect just says that quantity demanded will change in price due, or excuse me, quantity demanded will change due to price changing because of the fact that it will affect your purchasing power. We're not saying that your income went up or your income went down, but let's just say you have a fixed budget or a fixed income. Let's say there's twenty dollars in your pocket. Because the price change, you can now purchase more of a good or less of a good because of its fluctuation rep representative or relative to your current budget of $20. So even though your income didn't change, it will, as we talk about variables that shift market demand, but since it hasn't changed currently, it's still affecting your quantity demanded because of the fact that you can either purchase more or less than before because the price changed. The second uh, reason for this is known as the substitution effect. So if there is a good or service that you can use in place of your current product that you're considering to, to purchase, uh, basically if you lower the price of that good or service or if the price in the market goes up or down, that means that that substitute or that alternative product that you could purchase is now more expensive or less expensive relative to that specific good that you care about. So that's the substitution effect. So you might say, well, now the price of this went up. I'm pretty much indifferent between this and the substitute, so I'll just go with the substitute because it's cheaper. So let's talk about the income effect a little bit in more detail. Uh, basically... Um, again, your income hasn't changed, but the amount you can buy with it has. So an example here I have is that what if I have $69 and I go to a convenience store and the purchase price for a drink, assuming no sales tax, is $1. If I wanted to spend my entire budget on beverages, I could buy 69 of those drinks. But let's say that there's a decrease in the price to 69 cents per drink. Again, assume no sales tax. If I spent my entire budget on it, I can now afford 100. So this isn't to say that I'm going to buy 69 beverages or 100 beverages. It's just to say that because the price went down, I could technically buy more of it. And in some cases, I will buy more of it. And so the market demand is for everybody, not just you. So even if you buy the same quantity, even though the price went down and you just enjoy the savings, there are other people that might actually say, you know what, now that 69 cents Instead of a dollar, I'll buy two instead of one, one for my friend and one for me, or maybe one for the road and one for getting gas, whatever the reason, they're going to purchase more. And overall, that's going to result in an increase in the quantity demanded for the product. Turning our attention to the substitution effect. So this isn't to say that the price of the other good is is changing. It's just saying the price of this good is changing. So let's talk about the relationship between the iPhone and the Samsung Galaxy. They're both cell phones, they're both popular cell phones, and they're mainly the flagship phones that most people use these days if they have smartphones. So if we're looking at market demand for the iPhone and the price of the iPhone goes up, that means that the Samsung Galaxy is now cheaper relative to the iPhone. And for individuals who don't really know how to use the phone in either case, they might just say, well, you know what, since the iPhone is more expensive, I'm just going to get the Galaxy anyway instead of the iPhone. And that results in a decrease in the quantity demanded of the product. And vice versa, if the iPhone price is lower and the Galaxy price is constant, then some people who are indifferent between the two might say, you know what, I guess I'll get the iPhone because it saves me a little, a little bit of money. So that's the substitution effect. Now the question is, is price the only determinant of demand? Uh, is it the only reason why we purchase products? Well, I spoiled it a little bit earlier, but essentially, no. Uh, we pay different prices for different goods and services. We uh, have different preferences for different goods and services. And so price is not the only reason why we purchase certain products. The trick, though, is that 
when we want to analyze the relationship between another variable that might affect our uh, demand for a specific good or service, our graph has only got two variables on it. It's got quantity and it's got price. And so if we change anything that is related to demand for that specific good or service that we're measuring, such as televisions in our example in this lecture, we're going to have to do something with that demand curve. It's going to have to be a little bit different because we're not measuring income. We're not measuring prices of substitute goods. We're not measuring whether we like something or not. We're not measuring how the price might change in the future. We're not measuring how many people actually need that product. Those are the variables that also affect demand just as much as price, but we don't have it on the graph, so we have to visualize it by shifting the entire curve. So if price changes, we change the quantity demanded. So quantity demand is just a specific point on our demand curve. Demand is the entire curve. So if we change income or some other variable, or you really like an artist that's endorsing products, so you're gonna buy that product, that's gonna shift the demand curve. That's gonna shift it in an, an entirely different direction in a little bit because you're essentially changing the the assumptions so our law of demand and our movement along a demand curve due to changes in prices is because of that ceteris paribus condition that condition that we're assuming that all these other things that could affect demand aren't changing at all so if we do change then the assumptions are different and the curve is completely different so we will shift it to the left or to the right based on whether it's an increase or decrease in demand so if it's an increase in demand, we're going to shift the curve to the right. And if we decrease demand, we're going to shift the curve to the left. So here's an example of an increase in demand. So the blue, that dark blue demand curve is our original demand curve. And as a result of some variable other than price changing, we shift the demand curve to the right. So that red line represents the new demand curve and that is an increase in demand, it will shift to the right. If we have a decrease in demand, our, again, our original navy blue, uh, dark blue demand curve is now decreasing, so it shifts to the left to the new point, which is represented by the red demand curve. So what are these variables? I mentioned them just a minute ago, but let's go through them in more detail. The variables that shift market demand are these five. So this doesn't mean that these are the only five reasons. It's just five categories. So the first one is income. So before we talked about the income effect, meaning that like if the price changes, it affects your purchasing power of a fixed budget. But now instead of changing the price, we're changing the actual amount of money that you have. The second variable is prices of related goods. So we talked about one type of related good already, which is substitutes. So instead of changing the price of the product that we're measuring, so let's say we're measuring televisions or iPhones, the product that we could purchase instead, that price is now changing and the price that we're measuring here is constant. The third category, uh, actually there's another related good, but we'll get to that. But the third category is tastes and preferences. So this is kind of a catch-all for all the things that might convince you for better or for worse to purchase or not purchase a good or service based on your own subjective feelings about a specific product. The fourth category is populations. So kind of inflows or outflows of specific relevant populations to your product might affect the demand for that product. And the last category is expected future prices. So this is the price of the product that we're measuring on the graph, but it hasn't happened yet. We're just anticipating whether or not that price is going to change and that can induce our current behavior. So let's talk about income. There are two types of goods that we need to talk about when we talk about whether or not demand is going to change as a result of income changing. Most of our goods are going to be normal goods. These are just goods or services where basically as income goes up demand goes up and as income goes down demand goes down because we can't afford as much of it or if income goes up we we can afford more of it and we want more of it potentially so we actually demand more of it however that's not how all goods work 
there's also what's known as inferior goods. And inferior goods are basically the opposite. Inferior goods are goods where basically if your income goes up, your demand for that product goes down. And if the income level goes down, then the demand for that product goes up. And the reason why that is, is inferior goods are typically necessities. So case in point, uh, back after I graduated law school, I was struggling to find work whether it be in the legal profession or just in general, like just working at a grocery store or retail or food service or whatever. I was just trying to find any job at that point. And the rent was due and I hadn't had a job yet and my income was running out. And so basically for a week straight, I ate ramen. However, when I got for my first paycheck, that ramen went back into the uh, cupboard and it was not touched again until I moved away three years later. So, ramen to me is an inferior good. That doesn't mean that it's an inferior good for everybody. So again, it's market demand, so it's the prevailing feeling of the market that determines whether or not something's a normal good or inferior good. My college roommate loved ramen. I called him up after he got his first big job, asked him if he was still eating ramen. He's like, of course I'm still eating ramen. I love ramen. Uh, back in the days in the dorm room, we would, uh, probably not the best for us, but we just had a microwave. We didn't have a kitchen. So basically we would crunch up the ramen, put it in a red solo cup, fill it up with water, microwave it. Hopefully that softened the noodles up for me. I would add the salt packet for him. He would add sriracha and that was his go-to snack. But so for him subjectively it was inferior, but for the prevailing market, ramen tends to be an inferior good. The next category, so this is the second major category, is prices of related goods. We've already talked about substitutes. Basically, if, the, if we're measuring the market for iPhones and the price of the Galaxy goes up now, again, we're not talking about the price of the iPhone. The price of the iPhone is constant. So if the price of the iPhone changed, we would move along that given demand curve. But that original demand curve is operating under the assumption that, say, the Samsung Galaxy is only being sold for $800. But let's say that the price of the Galaxy now is being sold for $900. If it's now being sold for $900, then that means that the assumption has to change. And what's going to be the consequence of that? Well, some people are going to be like, well, the Galaxy is now too expensive, so I'll just get the iPhone instead because its price has been, remained constant. So as a result, there would be an increase in demand for an iPhone, and we would actually have a shift to the right of our demand curve. Alternatively, if the price of the Galaxy goes down, maybe there's a sale at Best Buy or on Amazon or some other website or through Samsung itself, and the price is, say, 650 then that would change the underlying assumption because a lot of people might decide, you know what, I think it's worth it to get that lower price so they end up decreasing their demand for iPhones and increasing their demand for Galaxies. However, that's not the only related good that we could have. It's not the only relationship we can have between two products. We also have complementary relationships. So these are goods and services that are typically purchased and used together. So the reason why this is important is because of the fact that if we're purchasing them together, then we need to take into account the cost of them both together. So say a video game console and an additional controller or a hard drive associated with it, that's the total cost of the bundle. And so if the total cost of that whole bundle is more expensive than you're willing to pay, you might not get any of it. So compliments could be like peanut butter and jelly, spaghetti and meatballs, macaroni and cheese, etc., etc. But uh, the way I like to use an example is... Uh, I like to make baked ziti. I learned how to make it at one of my jobs in college, and I love it. I don't make it that often because it's expensive to make at home. 
So when I go to the grocery store and I decide, hey, I'm going to make some baked ziti, you first go get the ziti noodles, and that's like a buck, and then you get the sauce, and that's not too expensive. If you want to add a little bit of meat to it, you can, but I don't usually. But really the most expensive a uh, component of the ZD is the cheese, just like if you have a pizza, the cheese is the most expensive component. Well, you need ricotta cheese, and I like to put mozzarella on top, sometimes pepper jack if I want a little spice in my life. But essentially I'll go to there and I'll discover that the cheese is really expensive, and then instead of just having ZD doodles with pasta sauce and maybe a little bit of ground beef, I just don't eat any of or I don't purchase any of it I abandon the shopping cart and I leave because since the price of the complimentary goods to the baked ziti noodles was too high I ended up getting neither so if you decide you want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich you need you get the bread cool you get the peanut butter cool but the jelly is too expensive yeah some people will decide that I can just eat a peanut butter sandwich by myself. But for those who are adamant on that ratio of peanut butter to jelly with the bread for the full experience, they're just not going to buy either of them, and the demand will go down for peanut butter or for bread. So if the price of a complimentary good goes up, the demand for the product that you're actually considering goes down because some people will not buy them the other product at all because they're – essentially worthless without each other in the eyes of the consumer now if the price goes down then it actually means that it's cheaper to buy the bundle together and then you end up getting an increase in demand for both of those products together so those first two are kind of the ones that involve the most thought because you have to understand is it a complement is it a substitute are they related at all for income is it a normal good or is it an inferior good and based on that analysis your shift in the curve is going to vary now when we talk about tastes and preferences this is pretty simple basically it's anything that you subjectively want or dislike about a product that convinces you to buy more or less of it or it or not it so basically this could be related to medical studies advertisements marketing associations with people or places etc etc basically if it makes you want it more then that's going to increase the demand for that product if it makes the market want it less if there's a negative outlook say it turns out a specific product is associated with a bad person or it's associated with bad uh, medical outcomes, cancer, etc., then it's going to decrease the demand for that product. So basically, if you like it and it makes you like it more, then it increases demand. If it makes you like it less, then it decreases the demand for that product. So the last two variables I've combined into one slide. Basically, population and demographics just speaks to whether or not the relevant market or population for the good or service that you're measuring is increasing or decreasing. Obviously, if the population goes up for your relevant market for the good or service that you're measuring, there's going to be an increase in demand and that demand curve is going to shift to the right. However, if that market population decreases, so maybe you're a business owner in a specific state where there's a decrease in population, well, then there's going to be a decrease in demand for your product because there's fewer people there to consume it. So it's pretty much just kind of flows in and out of population. So a lot of people might be moving to a specific state, so there might be an increase in demand for that product in that state and vice versa so pretty straightforward it's just whether or not there's more people there to consume it than or less people there to consume it that really affects the direction of the demand curve the last category speaks to expected future prices so this one's a little bit tricky and it's actually the only variable that is common between supply and demand besides price i mean it's it's price so obviously it's going to be in both but basically what it really speaks to is that 
it doesn't matter whether the speculation is accurate or not. If people believe that the price of a specific good or service is going to go up in the future, so let's say you go get gas and you typically know that gas goes up on Thursdays, then you're probably going to increase your demand for gasoline and the market's going to increase its demand for gasoline on Wednesdays because they don't want to get stuck paying the higher price. On the other hand, if you know that the price is going to be lower in the future, or you believe it to be true, it's going to induce your demand to wait to buy that product and decrease current demand, but it'll increase future demand. But we don't care about future demand on the current graph. We care about current demand. So essentially, it doesn't even mean that that's actually going to happen so it could turn out that you get the gas on wednesday and the gas goes down on thursday it doesn't really matter because the demand has already occurred and the transactions have already occurred but generally speaking most people will kind of follow trends because they believe that that trajectory is going to be consistent so if you think that the price is going to be higher tomorrow you buy more today if you think that the price is going to be higher or it's going to be lower tomorrow, you buy more tomorrow and less today. So that basically wraps up the entire kind of spectrum of demand. We talked about what it is, quantity demanded, the difference between the two. I'll reiterate that at the end of the lecture, uh, that basically the demand curve helps us understand the law of demand and the relationships. Um, the variables that can affect market demand that aren't just price. And basically, we will now transition to talking about supply. So supply, a lot of these upcoming slides related to supply might actually seem like mirror images of demand. And that's true. They should be feel that way because we're now looking at instead of the perspective of the consumer who's trying to get as much out of their limited budget, their scarce budget as possible to get the things that they need and want. We're now looking at it from the perspective of a firm who's trying to get as much money as possible to basically get the requisite reward for the risk that they're undertaking to produce goods and services. So what is the definition of supply? Supply is the willingness and ability for a firm to produce and sell a good or a service. So again, that willingness and ability is there. So a firm might say, okay, well, we see that that's a good price, but if we don't have enough resources to produce that quantity, then we can't factor in how much we'd like to produce. We can only factor in how much we can actually produce. So it's the willingness and ability for a firm to produce and sell a good or service. Again, this differs from quantity supplied. So supply basically is going to be the entire supply curve. Quantity supplied is the amount of a good or service a firm is willing and able to produce and sell at a specific price. So if it turns out that the television is going to sell for $700, then the firm is going to be willing and able to produce a specific amount of televisions at that $700 threshold versus say a $500 or a $900 threshold where they might produce more or fewer televisions based on their costs and things like that. Again, this difference will be identifiable when we talk about the supply curve. Again, just like before, we can analyze supply in three ways. Supply schedule is a table, supply curve will be a graph, and when we talk about market equilibrium, we will have an equation that represents supply for that market. And we can use math to solve the same equilibrium problem that we could do graphically when we get to talking about equilibrium. So here's a supply schedule for televisions. So again, we're going to have a column that represents the price that the market has set at a specific point and the overall amount of televisions that will be produced in the second column. So again, this is not one specific firm, it's the entire market of all the firms that produce televisions and how many televisions that they'll produce at specific prices. So notice here that at $200, we have a half a million televisions that would be supplied by the market. 
But as we increase the price to 400 to 600 to 800 to a thousand dollars, the quantity supplied continuously increases to one million, one and a half million, two million, and two and a half million, respectively. Again, what can we do with this supply schedule? We can take this data, plot it on a graph, and then we can get a supply curve that can help us understand the relationships between supply and demand and the upward sloping relationship of supply and things like that. So again, price is going to be on the y-axis and quantity is going to be on the x-axis. So here is a graph that we took from the data before. So again, just like before, we have basically uh, an initial point that we had here that was 200, at $200, the market was willing to produce a half a million units. At $400, they were willing and able to produce a million units. At $600, they were willing and able to produce 1.5 million units. At $800, they were willing to produce 2.2 2 million units. And lastly, at $1,000, they're willing and able to produce 2.5 million units. So let's just take this point right here. We're going to call this point D. At point D, there's 800. The price is 800, and the quantity that's going to be supplied by the market, so we'll call this a supply curve, quantity supplied is going to be 2 million units. And so at point D, Let's just say that the price goes up to $900. The quantity demanded will now go up to, say, 2.25 million units. So we're now at point E. And so we have 2.25 million units at $900. So at that $900 point, the quantity supplied went up. So again, to understand the difference between supply and quantity supply, quantity supply is a specific point on a given supply curve. Supply is the entire supply curve. So as we talked about with demand, there are variables that can affect supply that aren't price. And when that happens, we would end up shifting the supply curve as a result. So before we get into that, let's talk about why a supply curve is upward sloping. So again, we have our ceteris paribus condition. There could be other reasons why supply is at a certain level that isn't price. We're gonna hold all that constant. That's all being held constant. It's not changing. But when we look at the specific relationship between price and quantity supplied, when we hold all those other variables constant, if the price of the product goes up, the quantity supplied for that product will also go up. If the price of the product goes down, well then the quantity supplied for that product will also go down. And this is known as the law of supply. So the law of supply is just this positive upward sloping relationship of the supply curve. If price goes up, quantity supplied goes up. And if price goes down, quantity supplied goes down. So why is this the case? The difference here is that we're looking at it from the perspective of the producer, not the consumer. And this is, takes me back to the story about John Jacob Astor at the beginning of the lecture. The reason why he was willing to take on those costs, they were substantial, the risks, those were even more substantial. You've got people boating around the earth. You've got people hiking through wilderness to basically survey and get to land to build a trading post on the complete opposite side of the country as to where he was currently stationed. And the reason why is because of the economic incentive that was created. The reason why they were willing and able to take those risks was because there was a potential lucrative reward as a result. So as a result of a higher price being commanded for a specific good or service, that's why there's a higher quantity supplied because there's a higher reward. But when the difference between demand and supply is that if you can't afford a specific product, you don't get the product, but you don't lose anything. If the firm produces a product and sells it at a price too high, they don't sell it. They still have already undertook costs, so they lose money as a result. And so essentially 
in order for the firm to be willing and able to produce a higher quantity of something, you have to provide an incentive in the form of a higher price. So is price the only determinant of supply? Of course it's not. Uh, it's again, the reason it's a main factor. So that's the reason why it's on the graph and not some other variable, but it's not the sole determinant of supply. So again, what will happen is if we change some other variable that isn't the specific price of the good or service that we're measuring. So in this case, television. So if, the, if we're not focusing on the change in the price of televisions and it's some other variable that could affect supply, then if that change in that variable results in an increase in supply, we will visualize that with a shift to the right of the supply curve. And if it results in a decrease in supply, then we'll shift it back into the left. And that represents a decrease in supply. So here is a graph that represents increase in supply. So again, we have our dark blue supply curve that represents our initial supply curve. And if there's a variable that changes that results in an increase in supply, we will shift the curve to the right and end up at that red line, which is our new supply curve. We'll call it S2. If we have a decrease in supply, then we're going to start at that dark blue line and it's going to shift to the left to the new red line from S1 to S2, and that represents a decrease in supply. So if there's any sort of variable that's changing that results in a decrease in supply, we shift the supply curve to the left. And if there's something that results in an increase in supply, we shift the supply curve to the right. Now let's talk about those variables that result in shifts of the supply curve. The first one is technology. The second one is prices of inputs. So inputs are basically anything that's used to produce the good or service. The third one is alternatives in production, which is kind of the substitute relationship, but a little bit different. And it's important to know the difference. Number of firms. So how many people or excuse me, how many firms are actually producing the good or service? And then lastly, expected future prices. But instead of it being like with demand, it's the same variable, but it's going to be from the perspective of the producer and not the consumer. So technology is important. Last lecture, we talked about how technology is important in terms of production possibilities frontier. If we increase in technology, we shifted the uh, production possibilities frontier out and to the right. And the same will happen for supply. If it turns out that we've come up with some technological innovation or advancement that allows for more efficient production of that good or service, that will result in us being able to produce more at potentially a lower cost or at a smaller amount of time. And as a result, there would be an increase in the supply of that good or service. And just like with the PPF where that shifted out into the right, the supply curve will also shift out into the right because we can produce things more efficiently with our scarce resources. So a lot of textbooks talk about only about the uh, positive aspects of technological advancement. But there are going to be situations in which there is going to be interferences with the production process. A machine goes down, there is a malfunction, there's a natural disaster. So back in 2011, iPad production got stymied because of a massive hurricane and earthquake tsunami in Japan uh, in 2011. And that it wasn't as a result of technological advancement or going backwards or going into the dark ages. It's really just there's interferences with your production process that decrease your current level of supply. So if that happens, then we would represent that by a shift to the left of the supply curve and a decrease in supply. Our second variable speaks to cost. So the big difference between firms and consumers is that they're producing the product and incurring cost up front. A consumer doesn't really incur cost until it's made. And that's why you buy it. But essentially what's going on here is that a lot of firms have specific budgets or they, if they incur additional costs, 
they might not be able to pass it on the consumer right away. And if you take a macroeconomics course, this is something that's known as menu costs that uh, firms are, might be reluctant to change prices because they don't want to lose consumers. So if there is a increase in the price of an input, so again, an input is anything like raw materials, labor, capital, etc., any of those factors of production that we talked about in last lecture, if any of those increase in cost, then that's going to result in an increase in the production cost of the good or service that you're making. And as a result, whether you have a fixed budget or you don't want to upset your consumers and you can't change your price right away, that's going to result in a decrease in the supply of a product. So if it's more expensive for them to produce it, they're going to produce less of it. Simple as that. Now, if there's a decrease in the price of an input, well, then that means that they can afford more of those raw materials with a constant budget or a similar budget. And as a result, that's going to result in an increase in the supply of the product, and we're going to have a shift to the right of the supply curve. So higher costs, lower supply, lower costs, higher supply for the firm. This third category specifically speaks to a firm that could produce different products with similar resources. So if you think back to the production possibilities front to your last lecture, we can kind of think about Ford and how they could kind of produce hybrid cars or trucks with similar resources. Obviously, they don't can't really necessarily use like the batteries from the hybrids for the trucks, but the other materials, the aluminum, the steering wheels, the tires, etc., they can use that to assemble vehicles with similar resources. The reality is, is that the firm's, in the, be the firm's best interest is to make as much money as possible. So what they're going to do is they're going to divert those resources or devote those resources to the products that yield them more money. So if we're looking at the market for televisions and we have a firm that could either produce televisions or computer monitors and because of the a surge in uh, influencers recording videos on their computer and live streamers or esports or things of that nature. Maybe there's a higher demand for computer monitors over televisions and they can use those similar displays and materials to produce computer monitors instead of televisions. And so if it turns out that the computer monitors make more money than the televisions, then the firm is going to devote those resources that they could have originally used for televisions into producing computer monitors. So they're going to divert resources away and they're going to supply less televisions to the market. So if this happens, that means that the firm could either produce televisions or computer monitors and they realize that the computer monitor makes them more money they're going to decrease the supply and have a shift to the left of the supply curve for televisions uh, to help kind of produce the level of computer monitors that they want and make more money now if it turns out to be the opposite that basically televisions are in higher demand than computer monitors mainly because a lot of people just use laptops these days they don't really care about having a computer monitor and they'd rather have a large television for video game consoles or for watching sporting events or etc in movies then that firm will devote those resources now to producing the televisions instead of the computer monitors and so we'd actually have an increase in supply for the televisions so Basically, this just says that if the product that they can make instead makes them more money, then they'll decrease the supply of the product that you're measuring. And if the product that you're measuring makes them more money than the alternative products that they could make, then that will increase the supply for your project because they're going to devote more resources to it. I've put the last two variables on one slide as again, just like I did with the last two variables that could affect market demand. For supply here, we have number of firms. It's kind of just like with populations, if the number of companies making the product increases, that's going to influx more product into the market and result in an increase in supply, which will be represented by a shift to the right of the supply curve. If there's a decrease in the number of firms that are available, in the market, 
then so say maybe some of the uh, companies went out of business, the television companies went out of business, then there's going to be less stock available. So there's going to be a decrease in supply as a result. And we would shift the supply curve to the left. Expected future prices is now from the perspective of firms and not consumers. So firms are trying to get as much money for their product as possible. And consumers are trying to get as less or get the product for as less money as possible or as, for the lowest amount of money as possible. So in this perspective, now what's going to happen is if the firm believes that the product of the good or service is going to be higher in the future, then what they're going to do is they're going to not make product available and they're going to withhold their supply and decrease their current supply available until that newer, higher price is in the market and then at that point then they'll make it available so don't think about this so much from the perspective of oh well a firm knows they're going to make more money in the future so they're going to ramp up production now they might be doing that behind the scenes but the market again remember markets are institutions where the buyers and sellers come together to trade so me working at my job and getting income and the firm producing product is kind of just the behind the scenes stuff what really matters is the product that's finished and the amount of money that I take to the market in that product market to figure out whether or not a transaction occurs that matters. And the graph of supply and demand is actually measuring the market analysis, not so much the production analysis behind the scenes. So if the firm believes that they're going to make more money in the future, they're going to cut their current supply right now and decrease supply. And that'll be represented by a shift to the left of the supply curve. Now, if it turns out that they see that the price is going to be low next week, next year, then before, then they're going to try and flood the market with their current inventory, and that's going to increase current supply that's available for transactions on the market. So the question now is, as the philosopher Axel Rose once said, where do we go now? Well, the, where we go now is we need to combine demand and supply together to see how they interact with each other and how the market system works out and whether or not that market system creates a level of efficiency that we desire in economics. So this is a graph that takes the data that we had for market demand for televisions from the, from the demand schedule to the demand curve. And then that is represented by the dark blue downward sloping curve. So I will denote that as demand. That's not P, that's D, demand. And then that upward sloping red curve is representing supply. So the question now is how does the market interact with each other? What really ends up happening? So. The question is, is okay, what price do we charge? How many units do we produce? How do we get a clear market or an efficient market with this supply and demand for televisions? Well, if we let suppliers choose, they're going to charge as high of a price as they possibly can. And because their goal is to make as much money as possible. The problem with that is that if we let the suppliers dictate the price, which in a way they do currently, but through market research and focus groups and things like that, they try to figure out kind of what is the appropriate price to sell it at. Let's say they charge $1,000. The problem is, is that there was only 500,000 units demanded at five, or excuse me, at $1,000 per television, and there were two and a half million produced. If we're trying to be allocatively efficient or just efficient in general, and we have limited resources and scarce resources. We don't want a television producer to produce 2 million in excess. So we call that surplus or excess. There would be 2 million additional uh, televisions in excess of the requisite demand. So yes, they'd sell a half a million units because there's 500,000 units worth that are demanded at $1,000, but then you still have 2 million televisions that those resources could have been used to produce other goods and services that consumers wanted 
and now they're gone and wasted into producing TVs that nobody's willing to buy. So that's bad. I like to call this the Goldilocks principle, that basically we want to have that just right scenario. So if we charge too much, then we have wasted resources. Now, if we let consumers choose, they might say, hey, let's charge $400 or $200, go with $200 for a television. We're willing and able to pay $200 for that television. Well, two and a half million units were demanded at $200 for that television. But the consumers are going to, or excuse me, the producers and the firms are going to say, we can't really produce that many televisions at that low of a cost. It's just not worth it to us, and there's a higher risk. We might lose a lot of money in that process. And so as a result, they only supply the market with a half a million units. Well, then that means that there's two million units that would have been bought if there was requisite to make, excuse me, supply there that just doesn't happen, and that's what we call a shortage. We don't want a shortage. So that means that the, the price is too low, and that there's people that are now left empty-handed. So in the excess or surplus problem, we have a scenario where basically they produce too much. We wasted resources. In the other case, we have a shortage problem where basically people actually have the willingness and ability and the means to buy the product at that price, but there's just not enough available. So people get left empty-handed even when they can afford it. We don't want that either. What we want to find is a point in which it is just right, where the amount produced equals the right amount demanded, and it's at a specific price, and we have a specific quantity that we produce, and that's known as market equilibrium. So to demonstrate what I just talked about, basically if the firm charges $1,000, we end up with this excess or surplus here of 2 million units. That's wasted resources. On the other hand, at the bottom, if we let consumers decide, we have a shortage of 2 million units. And that's not good. So the question there, and this is the reason why we use curves instead of just straight up data, sometimes to understand this concept, is this downward sloping demand curve demonstrates the law of demand, the inverse relationship. The upward sloping supply curve represents the law of supply, the positive relationship. Putting them together shows this kind of competing interest situation, but it helps us easily identify what's known as our market equilibrium. The market equilibrium is going to be the point where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded, and that's going to be the point where your two curves intersect. So our market equilibrium is going to be right here where quantity supplied, which I'll denote as Q sub S, is equal to quantity demanded, which I will denote as Q sub D. So if we just go la di da da down to the uh, x-axis, that will tell us what our quantity is going to be. And if we go over to the y-axis, la di da di da that tells us what our price is going to be. So in this market for televisions that we've been building for the last hour or so, there will be a price market price that is allocatively efficient of $600 and we will produce 1.5 and sell 1.5 million televisions. So again, market equilibrium uh, is the point where quantity supplied is equal to quantity demand. So that's just the intersection point of our supply and demand curves. This is our allocatively efficient point. We don't waste resources. There's no excess televisions lying around. And we also don't have people who are left empty handed, even if they have the means to fork over the cash for the good or service that they want. So as we mentioned before, our equilibrium is going to be at $600 and 1.5 million units. And we call the equilibrium price P star and we call the equilibrium price Q star. So this is P star and this is Q star. So market equilibrium is pretty simple in the form of a graph. Um, that's why we use the curves. The curves help us understand the relationships in a easy, more simplified visual model. So again, remember, we're boiling down the complicated world down to a simple two-dimensional graph. 
So there's going to be some data that's missing. There's going to be some inaccuracies. There's going to be things that we might want in terms of information that we're going to sacrifice in the form of you truly understanding the relationship. Because the takeaway from this is you need to understand what demand is, the difference between quantity demanded and demand itself. So quantity demand is just a point on the demand curve. Demand is the entire curve itself. And you need to understand those definitions. You need to understand all the elements that affect demand so all those variables prices of related goods income tastes and preferences expected future prices uh populations etc you need to understand the reason for the law of demand so the income effect and the substitution effect for supply you need to understand truly what it is why there's an upward sloping relationship and that really goes back to that john jacob astor story about uh, risk uh, and reward that basically the higher the reward the higher the risk and that's why they're willing to produce more and take on higher costs if they know that there's going to be a higher reward at the end of the tunnel and that's what John Jacob Astor did he he sacrificed men's lives and risked them and uh, spent year had an army of men go across America by land and by sea to try and develop a worldwide trading post and trading organization so he could maximize uh the long story short of the story is that he was only in control of that for a couple of years and he ended up selling it to another trading company that was owned by britain so was he ultimately successful not necessarily but because he knew that there was such a high reward there he was willing to take the risk so that's not to speak to whether or not it's a good it was a good idea a bad idea um that's not really up to me to decide it was just there to kind of demonstrate that basically that law of supply there is because there was a requisite demand so they were willing to take on a higher risk because there was a higher reward there you also need to understand all the variables that will shift the market supply curve to the left or to the right. So remember an increase in supply is a shift to the right, a decrease in supply is a shift to the left. And so that's technology prices of inputs, alternatives in production, number of firms, and expected future prices. And then last but not least, and essentially what might be the most important takeaway, is figuring out when you put all that together, where does the market end up? How much gets made? how much it's sold for, and as we'll learn in the le next lecture, kind of what is the benefit of being quote-unquote allocatively efficient. But before we move on to our next lecture and wrap this thing up, I want to talk about how we can actually use mathematical equations to come to the same conclusion that we did with our demand and supply curves that we derived from those schedules and drew on a graph. The third way to analyze this is through math. So I'm not going to have you derive equations for supply and demand. They will be given to you to do the analysis. So believe it or not, from the table that I've given you through this entire lecture and the demand and supply curves that I've given you through this entire lecture, the demand curve can be derived from the equation that has Q sub D listed on it. And then the supply curve can be derived from to be this equation that has QS on it. So QD represents the quantity demanded of the televisions. And P represents the price for those televisions. So the demand curve for, that we've been analyzing this entire lecture has an a equation value of negative 2500P plus 3 million. And then Q sub S has a equation that's just 2,500 P. So again, that 3 million represents an intercept. The negative sign that associates with the QD represents that law of demand where there's an inverse relationship between price and quantity demand. So if price goes up, quantity demand is going to go down because of that negative sign. And if price goes down, quantity demand is going to go up. Q sub S has no has an intercept at zero that's the reason why there's no plus or minus attached to it beyond the 2500 p again that 2500 for both represents the slope of the supply and demand curves respectively and again 
uh, the reason why there's no negative sign there for the QS equation is because there's a positive relationship between price and quantity supplied. So as price goes up, quantity supplied is going to increase. So the reason why I like equations is it gives you a lot more information because the curve gives you a decent amount of information, but you're kind of at the whim of the axes drawn and kind of the, the numbers that are labeled on that graph and the scale that's used. If you use a table, you're limited to the only to those only five listed values. We had five prices and five quantities demanded. The cool thing about using the equations is that you now have the ability to solve essentially any quantity and any price. So if you want to find out what the quantity demanded at $412.07 is, bam, plug in 412.07 into P and solve for Q and you have your answer. If you want to figure out what the quantity supplied is at $907.15, Bam, plug in 907.15 into the price equation and that or the price value on that QS equation, and bam, you've got the quantity supplied at that point. If you want to find market equilibrium, so the question then becomes like how do we solve the problem? How do we figure out what level of production uh, is going to be produced and what price it's going to be sold at to, pr to provide our allocatively efficient solution and our market equilibrium. All you have to do is plug those equations into each other because even though Q quantity demand and quantity supplied are different numbers, when you hit market equilibrium, they're going to be the same. So if QD and QS are the same in market equilibrium, then that means that you just set 2500p for the QS equation equal to the negative 2500p plus 3 million for the demand equation. Set those equal to each other and then you want to solve for your equilibrium price. And that will be your P star. So what you'll do is you'll solve the equation. You'll get a P that's equal to a specific number. That'll be your P star. That'll be your market equilibrium price. Once you have that, then you can plug that original p-value into both equations and you'll get the same answer for q, which will be your equilibrium quantity. We solved with the graph because fortunately we were able to see it easily that the quantity at market equilibrium is going to be 1.5 million units and that the equilibrium price is going to be $600. So we can use that information to confirm that what we found in the graph was accurate. So if we plug in 2500p equal to negative 2500p plus 3 million, we will take the we will add 2500p to both sides. So that cancels that out. We add the 2500p over here and that gives us 5000p is equal to 3 million. If we just divide both sides by 500, or excuse me, 5000 that cancels out, and then we can just cancel out, bam, 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 those three zeros, and then it's just 3,000 divided by 5, which is 600. So our equilibrium price is $600, just like we found with the graph. If we take that $600 value, that P star value, and plug it back into our original equations, so we have 20, for QS, we had 2,500 times 600, and then for QD, we have 2,500 times, excuse me, negative 2,500 times 600 plus 3 million. Both of those will give you the answer of $1.5 million. So it's just a little bit of algebra. I trust that you can handle that um, because you're all capable of doing algebra and, and completing these math problems. And I think it gives you more information and it helps you basically analyze things at a deeper level. You don't necessarily need a graph to analyze it. You don't necessarily need those demand curves and those supply curves. So this gives you another way to solve that same problem just with some simple equations. So I will finish this lecture by talking about what happens if those variables that we talked about, so such as demand changing or supply changing, when we're trying to figure out what equilibrium is. So we found equilibrium, it was $600 and 1.5 million units. But what happens 
if demand changes or supply changes, well, equilibrium is going to be different because that original equilibrium was operating under the assumption that we were using an initial demand curve and an initial supply curve. If supply changes, then that means that we now have to intersect that demand original demand curve with the new supply curve, and that's going to give us a new equilibrium price and a new equilibrium quantity. Now, without equations and a bunch of mess, you're not going to be able to pinpoint a specific new dollar value and a specific new quantity. But you can figure out when that variable shifts, whether or not the new equilibrium price is going to be higher or lower, and whether or not the new equilibrium quantity is going to be higher or lower. So let's say that televisions are a normal good, which they are. If there's an increase in our income, then that means that if there's an increase in income for a normal good, that results in an increase in demand for televisions. If there's an increase in demand for televisions, the demand curve is going to shift to the right, and that's going to result in an increase in our equilibrium price when it intersects the original supply curve and an increase in equilibrium quantity. Vice versa, let's say that television has been linked to bad vision and people don't want bad vision. So what they decide is they don't want televisions anymore. If there's a decrease in demand because of a negative taste and preference, then that's going to result in a shift to the left of the demand curve, a decrease in demand, and that's going to result in a decrease in equilibrium price and a decrease in equilibrium quantity. Now if we turn our attention to supply, let's say that uh, there's a new innovation in the production of televisions. There's a new piece of equipment that allows for it to be more easily produced. Well, then that's going to result in an increase in supply, and the supply curve is going to shift to the right. When we shift the supply curve to the right, that results in a decrease in equilibrium price and an increase in equilibrium quantity. Pretty sweet deal. Unfortunately, if there's a situation where basically the costs of the materials, the chips, the LED lights, the glass for the screen, if those inputs go up in cost, that's going to overall increase the cost of production for the firm, and that's going to result in a decrease in supply for that good or service, which is going to result in an increase in equilibrium price and a decrease in in equilibrium quantity. To demonstrate this, let's go with our original example of uh, income going up for households. So we'll label this our supply curve and label this our demand curve. If there's an increase in income and we have a normal good, then that's going to result in a shift to the right of the demand curve, an increase in demand to D2. This was our original equilibrium, but that no longer is relevant because our assumptions have changed and we have a new demand curve. So our new equilibrium is going to be right here. Now, because I conveniently intersected it there, we can actually determine that the equilibrium price is now $800 instead of $600, and our equilibrium quantity is now 2 million units. But as I mentioned before, $800 is higher than $600, so our equilibrium price went up but our equilibrium quantity also went up as well. So we have an increase in price and an increase in quantity. Now let's say that uh, our supply curve shifts to the left. It decreases because of that increase in cost of production of televisions. So we shift to the left. Remember, we're now operating at D2 and S2, because remember our demand shifted, so we're now operating on our second demand curve. And now that supply change, we're operating on our second supply curve. So that means our new equilibrium is going to be right here. We can't exactly determine what our exact price is going to be at that point, but compared to our price of $800, our price is definitely going to be higher. So as a result of that decrease in supply, we have an increase in price. 
And we also have definitely less than 2 million units, so we have a decrease in our quantity. So as a result of a decrease in supply, we have an increase in price at equilibrium and a decrease in quantity at equilibrium. And when we had that increase in demand, we had an increase in price and an increase in quantity at equilibrium. That concludes this lecture on demand and supply. Again, I highly recommend that if you feel like I went a little bit too fast, or you didn't catch some of the information to listen through the lecture again, please contact me with any questions. Uh, make sure that you are thorough in your analysis when you're doing homeworks, quizzes, and exams. And I look forward to discussing and developing this model further through the course because we really are going to spend essentially the rest of the course talking about this model within the context of individuals, within the context of businesses. And in our next lecture, we'll talk about kind of that allocative equilibrium point. Is that truly the best point? How do we demonstrate that? How do we measure that? And then when we talk about a relationship and a disconnect between efficiency and equity, what can the government do to intervene to try and promote equity over efficiency. So good luck on your assignments in this class and any other classes, and I look forward to discussing our further topics in the next lecture.